Or on the media hiring people who forgot they'd met the Russians? A presidential address to Congress followed by a Twitter meltdown in which he accused Barack Obama of tapping his phone? A humiliation on health care? The highly controversial budget ramming through his appointment to the Supreme Court, vowing to sort out North Korea, meeting China's leader. An airstrike in Syria, dropping the mother of all bombs on Islamic State. And an Easter egg hunt. As a reality TV star, Donald Trump may have been shallow, vain and ignorable. But he is now unignorable. He comes to us 24-7 a global media phenomenon from the ultimate Big Brother house over there. For the past hundred days, the world has woken up thinking, what's he done now? I'm trying to find out if Donald Trump has a plan or if he's just making up the most important job on earth as he goes along. What makes him tick and what will his next four years mean for the US government? Americans wanted to send a wrecking ball to Washington, and, and that's what they got. For the media? His base, they already agree with him in rejecting news reports in the media. Maybe they watch TV on mute and see him there looking presidential, and that's enough. For America? On a scale of 1 to 100, I would give Trump in the mid-90s for the first 100 days. And for the world? I'm worried about that 3 a.m. knock on the door to President Trump saying, I'm sorry to wake you, but something terrible's just happened and you have five minutes to make a decision. When America went to the polls on November the 8th, the world held its breath. So I would just say, take a breath on New Hampshire. Political know-it-alls predicted victory for boring old Hillary Clinton. They were wrong. When they started calling those states, they kept going red and red and red. If you want to know why Trump won, the Republicans of Macomb, Michigan, America's closest swing state, are the people to talk to. If we won Macomb, we won Michigan. If we won Michigan, we won the United States. Donald Trump has won the presidency. I'm going home and going to bed. By the early hours, it was clear America had a new president. God bless America. And instead of a politician, he was a permatant plutocrat with immobile hair and wandering hands. His supporters went wild. Eight years ago, Obama had been greeted like a rock star. Well, Trump was a hope and change candidate too, and millions felt he spoke for them. Maybe he wasn't our first choice, but we rallied around him because he's so principled and he constantly talked about the same issues. And if you see the distinct difference between the Trump administration and the Obama administration, he believes so firmly in the Constitution. Yes. He's such a patriot. We want somebody that can speak for our people, can protect our kids, our faith, somebody that loves this country. Donald Trump had a genius that no other politician or businessman that has run for president in the last 50 years has had. And it was all about giving the American people exactly what they want. And that is what he's doing, and that is what he's doing every time he upholds his campaign promise. The world gasped and waited to see what on earth would happen next. I have a feeling it's going to be beautiful. John Trump do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States the office of President of the United States and so on January the 20th 2017 a new name was added to the illustrious roll call that runs from George Washington through Abraham Lincoln to Franklin Delano Roosevelt and in the 45th President of the United States, Donald John Trump. This American carnage stops right here and stops right now.
As he took the oath of office, Trump looked out, he said, over a sea of love. But some media killjoys pointed out that Obama's sea of love had been more like an ocean. And the first row of Trump's fledgling presidency blew up. The president's press secretary, Sean Spicer, we'll be seeing a lot more of him, got very narky. Photographs of the inaugural proceedings were intentionally framed in a way, in one particular tweet, to minimize the enormous support that had gathered on the National Mall. These attempts to lessen the enthusiasm of the inauguration are shameful and wrong. The BBC's North America editor, John Sopel, was there. I went to Sean Spicer's first White House briefing on a Saturday evening, where he called us all in, uh, berated us for our coverage of the inauguration, and said that we were wrong to say that Donald Trump didn't have the biggest audience ever uh, for an inauguration. Thank you guys for being here tonight. I will see you on Monday. He refused to answer any questions and stormed out. And I was sitting next to uh, the Guardian correspondent who'd previously been the Southern Africa correspondent. He said, oh, it's just like being back in Zimbabwe. The so what most of us would regard as a fact, the Trump bunker considered merely opinion. Curious enough. But then a Trump spokesperson went on TV and it all got weirder. It undermines the credibility of the entire White House press office no, it on doesn't. day don't one. Be so, don't be so overly dramatic about it, Chuck. What it, it, you're saying it's a falsehood, and they're giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. But the point remains... Wait a minute. Alternative facts? Look, alternative facts are not facts. They're falsehoods. Alternative facts wasn't just a nonsensical turn of phrase. It signaled something totally new about how Trump's White House planned to communicate with the American people. It had cut out the middlemen, so screw the mainstream media. Tara Palmieri is White House correspondent for Politico magazine. She's a rising star in the press pack, unless you're press secretary Spicer, that is, in which case she is, quote, an idiot with no real sources. They'll think, we don't need you to carry our water, like convey our message for us. We have Twitter now. We can put our top senior officials on every single network. They don't want the filter. And frankly, like, Trump is really good at, at kind of like shaping the message every morning. And he knows that on Saturday, he will control the message on the Sunday shows by whatever he tweets on Saturday. It's just, it, it's brilliant. As an outsider, it seems, the belief inside the White House is that if you're not with us, you're against us and we don't need you. When I worked at the New York Post, I used to deal with Trump a lot and he would send stories back with red ink, circling adjectives he didn't like, writing notes. He's very involved. Even you see the way he communicates. Everything's amazing. Everything's great. Those are words you're not going to see in any respectable news outlet. It's going to be a beautiful health plan. You're not going to read that in a real reputable newspaper or see that on TV. So they are therefore the enemy and not supportive of him. In other words, if you're not telling the White House version of the story, you're not worth listening to. The notion spawned a phrase that's dominated these first hundred days, fake news. As you know, I have a running war with the media. They are among the most dishonest human beings on earth. Suddenly, that little finger was pointing at almost every major news outlet. I could name them, but I won't bother, but you have a few sitting right in front of us. I called the fake news the enemy of the people, and they are. Fake. The fake news. Fake news. It's fake. Phony. Fake. The enemy within? It's everywhere. Uh, can I just ask you, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, the Where are you from? Uh, BBC. Okay. Here's another beauty. It's a good line. Impartial, free and fair. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, Mr. President. Just like CNN. Right? 
Aren't they right in their suspicion that the mainstream media were biased against Trump? I put it differently. I think that some of the mainstream media are falling into the trap of allowing themselves to be painted as Trump's opposition. Trump loves having an opponent, whether it's lying Ted Cruz, little Marco Rubio, low energy Jeb or crooked Hillary. And now he's got the fake news media. We're not the opposition. We're there to hold politicians to account. But who needs accountability when Trump is such a master at writing his own script? He allows the press to really videotape him a lot, especially when he's working. It's almost like he wants a reality TV show going on inside the White House. You know, if I ever fell, would they be happy? <laughs> We see him signing executive orders, holding them up to show his signature. He looks like he is an executive president taking on all of these tasks, and he looks like he's working. That's a good visual. He's the reality TV president. He knows that substance doesn't matter. I mean, he knows that. Substance does matter. It does, but not when you're trying to communicate to a mass audience. Yeah. And his, his base? They already agree with him in rejecting, you know, the news reports in the media. They, they maybe they watch TV on mute and see him there looking presidential, and that's enough. Clever thing to have worked out. Right. Exactly. Is it possible that Trump, the reality star, got something right that in our trivial visual age, just looking presidential is half the job. It's a belief he would test to its limits in the coming months. Come on, come with me. But thank you looking everybody. presidential means looking decisive, and that means to be seen doing things. So Trump, the get-it-done CEO, swung into action with a series of so-called executive orders. Should I give this pen to Andrew? Dow Chemical. <laughs> I think maybe, right? He cancelled a long-planned trade deal and ordered construction of the border wall, reversed climate change policy, and got a room full of men to watch as he ended USA to international abortion counselling. An executive order is an expression of intent. It's something the president wants to have done. It doesn't need a vote, but it does need to be within the law. So whatever the president wants to do, it still has to work within the structure of American governance. That's the legislature, i.e. Congress, the judiciary, judges and courts, and the executive, the president and his staff. It's a system set out by Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist Papers. In paper number 70, Hamilton talks about why a powerful president is important. He says, Energy in the executive is a leading character in the definition of a good government. It is essential to the steady administration of the laws. Well, Trump certainly got energy. So is it going to produce good government? Increasingly, the American presidency, certainly during the Obama years and maybe now during the Trump years, is uh, taking the route of uh, going around the legislative action and doing more and more by executive order. Theodore Roosevelt Malach is an economist who served under presidents. He's seen as Trump's pick for a top ambassadorial job, and he's a big fan. And it is divisive as a mechanism, isn't it? Can be, because Congress feels like you're obviously going around them. Uh, but it is also, you know, from a expedience point of view, a way to efficiently get things done. Many CEOs have that kind of mentality. I'm not saying it's command and control. Uh, it's, it's, you know, not authoritarian to use the term, but it is the kind of view that a chief executive decides. And you might listen to a few board members, but basically in the end you decide. Wisconsin, I love Wisconsin. <laughs> Donald Trump promised the voters he'd be the boss of America Inc. But can you really run a country as you would a company? Well, America, the world, and Donald Trump himself were about to find out. Who would Chief Executive Trump appoint as board members of America Inc? 
Sitting on one side of the table are his high-profile daughter Ivanka and her husband Jared Kushner, a property developer turned so-called Secretary of Everything. On the other, a man called Steve Bannon. This one-time film producer and boss of the extreme right-wing website Breitbart News is now Trump's chief strategist. Most bafflingly incompetent group of people uh, in the White House who I've ever, ever seen. Robert Reich is a professor of public policy who served under three presidents, including as Bill Clinton's Secretary of Labor. What we see in this White House is not only people who have no experience governing, but also something of a disdain for the institutions of government. Bannon, Kushner and their spats have been a storyline all their own in President Trump's White House reality show. I have seen a lot of chaotic White Houses. I've worked in fairly chaotic White Houses. I've never encountered or viewed a White House that is quite as chaotic as Donald Trump's. Thank you very much. People are confused about their jobs. Uh, they are at each other's throats. They are leaking information like mad to the press. Trump's supporters, of course, see it differently. He brings the skills of business to public life, making bureaucracy understand action. Even in the Trump organization, in his private company of some scale, he managed on the basis of chaos. He likes to have different pockets or centers of power that actually rival each other, and then he makes the determination. So the White House is not dissimilar in some ways from the Trump Organization. How much of that is a good thing, how much of it is too much, uh, is probably still to be determined. It's an unorthodox approach, but then Trump was elected to shake up Washington. Protection of the nation from foreign terrorist entry into the United States. It's big stuff. When it came to one of his most noteworthy campaign promises, though, that lack of traditional process led the president to come a cropper. We got there about 3.30 p.m. When we got there, there was maybe like about four to 500 people there. By like 4.15, there was friends of mine that were coming to the airport. It was taking them an hour just to get there. People started parking their cars on the side, just walking there. It ended up being well over 10,000 people that were there. And it was nice to see the Muslim community, the Jewish community, the Christian community, the LGBT community, the Black Lives Matters community. The, it's like everybody stood together. And, and everybody was like standing together for like one sake, like pretty much saying like, he might be coming after the Muslims today, but is he going to be coming after you tomorrow? The so-called Muslim travel ban was an executive order issued in Trump's first week in office. It banned entry to the U.S. for people from seven mainly Muslim countries, including permanent U.S. residents. Why? Apparently to prevent America becoming a horrible mess. The city of Dearborn, Michigan is home both to the headquarters of the Ford Motor Company and to the largest mosque in America. Hussein de Badger is an entrepreneur and owns a downtown shisha bar. I hold in my mouth and I blow it out. This is tobacco. Is this is, yeah. It's just, it's flavored tobacco. It's tobacco and it's kind of like a molasses. Wow. Dearborn's population is around a third Arab American which landed it a starring role in the cable reality show All-American Muslim. But after Trump's executive order, the city's residents were back in the spotlight with the suggestion that being a Muslim was un-American. I feel like he's separating. We were all diverse here and we we're all getting along and then here comes Trump and Basically, now the eyes are on Muslims. Nurhan is an A and E nurse. I'm from Iraq. I was born there. You're Iraqi. You'd yes. Say. You're here as a refugee. Yes, I went to the refugee camps in Saudi Arabia, and 
and uh, we moved here in 1995. So I was about four years old. When I heard Trump was president, I didn't take it well, <laughs> especially because I don't have my citizenship. And I'm a legal resident here, but me traveling outside was going to give me problems. So I didn't take it really well. Do you think he's changed America? For the worse, yeah. Because we're going back to, like, basically history is repeating itself. What do you mean? He says he wants to make America great again. Do you truly believe that? As the ban was an executive order, it bypassed Congress. But even then, Trump couldn't have everything his own way. Within 48 hours, the third branch of government, the judiciary, had started blocking his ambitions. He responded, well, pretty typically. The ban polarized America. For Trump's supporters, it was exactly what they would voted him in to do. You know, I came here, immigrant from Iraq, and I went to school. I become a pharmacist. Um, I marry a surgeon. He came the same way. We came legally here. We went through yeah. all yeah. the paperwork that yeah. any country would go. The biggest misconception was that Donald Trump hates Muslims or that he hates Arabs. I think the mainstream media tried to twist his words into making it seem like he was against religious freedom and that he was a racist. Three months on, that executive order is still caught up in the courts. Turns out you can run the White House like your own corporation, but to run a country, you need the other branches of government to play ball. It was a crucial lesson for the new president, but would he learn it? While Trump was pushing for restrictions on America's new enemies, Everyone else wanted to know what he'd been up to with the old rival superpower. Did anyone from your team communicate with members of the Russian government or Russian intelligence? Can you say definitively that nobody on your campaign had any contacts with the Russians? Throughout this first hundred days, the one story that hasn't gone away is Russia, even if no one's quite sure what that story is. Senator Dick Durbin is the deputy Democrat leader in the Senate. What we know is that some 1,000 Russian, we call them trolls, sitting at computers in some building and somewhere in Russia, maybe in Moscow, were doing their level best to break into every computer base they could find. Trump had only been in office a fortnight when the U.S. National Security Services, the CIA, FBI and NSA, released a joint report. Its conclusion, that Putin and the Russian government aspired to help President-elect Trump's election chances when possible. It is the first time we can point to in the history of our nation when a foreign country has tried to influence the outcome of a presidential election. It wouldn't be surprising, though, would it? I mean, any government looks at what's going on in a country in whom it has an interest and wishes an outcome, and there is no evidence that they did influence the outcome of the election, is there? Well, I can't tell you that they didn't influence the outcome. We know the Russians did not have a direct impact on my casting a ballot or it being counted, but they did their level best. During the campaign, Trump had to ditch his campaign manager over his Russian connections. As president, he then had to fire Michael Flynn, his pick as national security advisor, for allegedly discussing sanctions with Russia before Trump took office. And somehow, his attorney general, Jeff Sessions, who would have overseen the investigation into Russian interference, failed to disclose that he had uh, twice met the Russian ambassador. Whoops. I have been called a surrogate at a time or two in that campaign, and I didn't have not have communications with the Russians, um, and I'm unable to comment on it. Unlike Flynn, Sessions didn't step down, though he did beg off the investigation. So that's okay then. Evan McMullen is a former CIA field operative turned senior Republican policy advisor. 
Donald Trump and his advisors have had close contact with Russians here in the United States and the Russian government for years. And I think the real issue is that Donald Trump would like to prioritize his relationship with Vladimir Putin, uh, which is one that I think is founded at least on an ideological sympathy over the ideals of the West, which are liberty, equality, liberal democracy, self-rule. These are not things that Donald Trump embraces. Are you really saying that he admires some thug like Vladimir Putin more than he admires fellow democracies? Absolutely. As in all love affairs, Donald and Vlad have had their differences, notably over Syria. Right now we're not getting along with Russia at all. We may be at an all-time low in terms of uh, relationship with Russia. Yet, just hours later, Trump was telling us everything was great again. It wouldn't be long, though, before Russia was looking like the least of Trump's foreign policy concerns. The Russia controversy did, however, bring Trump's talent for speaking direct to voters back to the fore. He started out by defending his beleaguered Attorney General. But as tweets came thick and fast, Trump's mood turned from defense to attack. In less time than an episode of The Apprentice, Trump had cast himself as the victim of an Obama ordered wiretap. Two weeks later, Press Secretary Spicer fingered the guilty party who had, allegedly, acted on Obama's behalf. He didn't use the NSA, he didn't use the CIA, he didn't use the FBI, and he didn't use the Department of Justice. He used GCHQ. What is that? It's the initials for the British Intelligence Spying Agency. What? The sound of jaws dropping in Whitehall must have been audible in Washington. In intelligence, the Anglo-American relationship is the most important either country has. You look at this stuff and you just think, where on earth did this rubbish come from? In this case, it wasn't the intelligence agencies, it was cable television. Trump's spokesman cited the claim and did attribute it. Last on Fox News on March 14th, Judge Andrew Napolitano made the following statement, quote, three intelligence sources have informed Fox News. Andrew Napolitano is better known as Judge Knapp, a pundit on the right-wing Fox News. Three intelligence sources have informed Fox News that President Obama went outside the chain of command. He didn't use the NSA, he didn't use the CIA, he didn't use the FBI, and he didn't use the Department of Justice. He used GCHQ. What the heck is GCHQ? That's the initials for the British spying agency. Fox News then said it couldn't confirm Napolitano's story. So did the White House apologize? Fat chance. I didn't make an opinion on it. That was a statement made by a very talented lawyer on Fox. And so you shouldn't be talking to me, you should be talking to Fox. So there you have it. Weeks of speculation, one accusation of illegal wiretapping against a former president, and a totally unproved accusation from a distinguished legal mind that the British were involved in such a thing. The Trump presidency is a little bit like the 1966 uh, spaghetti western called the uh, good, the bad, and the ugly. I mean, it's good in as much as he's doing exactly what he said he would do. The bad is that he's actually uh, coming to grips with how to operate in Washington, which is a political uh, situation and not a business one. Then there's the ugly part, which I, I think does have to do with all this uh, back and forth with the media and the way that he's being pictured and colored. Alongside that standoff, there were campaign pledges to deliver on. One of the most contentious was immigration and a certain beautiful wall.
As soon as Donald Trump was elected, we started to prepare for the worst. Solange Altman is a lawyer at El Concilio in Modesto, a northern Californian town with a large Latino population. Many are migrants who've lived and worked here for decades. Everybody wants to be a citizen, right? And why do you want to get your citizenship? Because this country has given you what your country didn't. Para no tener problema para cruzar la frontera también. So I won't have any problems crossing the border. If he travels um, back to his home country, he may not be able to return. A lot of Americans think that getting status is like going to apply for a library card. You go in and you just fill out the paperwork and you get it the same day. It's expensive, it's time consuming. And people are under the stress, fearful that they're not going to be approved. And, and um, it's really hard on families. Trump says he'll triple the deportation manpower of ICE, America's Immigration and Customs Force. What Solange's clients fear has already become reality for some. Within a fortnight of Trump's order, the first widely reported deportation became a media circus. Though liberals predictably get fired up about Trump's policies, Presidents of all stripes have targeted criminal, illegal immigrants. But the wall potentially changes everything. On day one, we will begin working on an impenetrable, physical, tall, powerful, beautiful southern border wall. It's been mocked by Game of Thrones geeks. We have no border. We have no control. People are flooding across. We need to build a wall, and it has to be built quickly. And by the former president of Mexico, a man with a turn of phrase that shocked his interviewer. I have to say that we're not. I am not going to pay for that fucking wall. I am not. So far, Mayor Brownville is going to be at our next meeting. But there's a reason Trump's pursuing the policy. Lots of people love it. His supporters in Modesto prove that. They felt Trump got their frustration with the system. These county Republicans meet monthly in an office downtown. They have no journalistic integrity at all anymore. Mm -hmm. Just the left side, the spin, fake news, and just outright lying. They dislike the mainstream media as much as their leader does, not least for its lazy assumptions about who thinks what. You get a lot of this. You, you think you can box them up uh, just because the group's Latino or whatnot, that they're all going to, say, vote left or vote liberal or be uh, against Trump and that kind of thing. But I work with a lot of the Latinos. Frankly, the more they're working, a lot of them are small business owners. A lot of them are, uh, share conservative ideas. He's not just for the white, rich elite. He's for everybody. And um, I think that's what we need to do, is that he's there too. I know it's the coined phrase, to make America great again. Something's got to change. And I don't think it's right that our state has to imprison uh, illegal alien criminals. Why should we allow American citizens to be corrupted by these dangerous people? We get all kinds of promises, you know, during a campaign that this is going to change and that. Nothing ever does. But Trump is just going down the checklist of the things that he campaigned on and is following through on every one of them. My administration has answered the pleas of the American people for immigration enforcement and border security. We want all Americans to succeed, but that can't happen in an environment of lawless chaos. As we speak tonight, we are removing gang members, drug dealers, and criminals that threaten our communities and prey on our very innocent citizens. Bad ones are going out as I speak, and as I promised throughout the campaign. There are bad people out there, and sometimes bad people do bad things. My heart goes out to those families that were hurt by immigrants, but by and large, immigrants do not commit more crimes than the general population. He uses it as a way to scare people. 
That's what Donald Trump does. Through his hyperbole and his repeated accusations and misstatements, people begin to believe that it's the truth. The president's beef with migrants isn't racist. His supporters say it's about safety and, crucially, it's about protecting American jobs. By finally enforcing our immigration laws, we will raise wages, help the unemployed, save billions and billions of dollars, and make our communities safer for everyone. And Donald J. Trump, entrepreneur and presumed billionaire, though it's hard to tell when he still won't release his tax returns, is taking a distinctly personal interest in job creation. Thank heavens for Trump, unless he's just taking the credit since my election, Ford, Fiat Chrysler, General Motors, Sprint, SoftBank, Lockheed, Intel, Walmart, and many others have announced that they will invest billions and billions of dollars in the United States and will create tens of thousands of new American jobs. This was our first 3D model, Jeremy, and this is hand-carved styrofoam. Gene Dickerson has worked in the auto industry for 40 years. The sort of thing to have Jeremy Clarkson wetting his pants, I think. <laughs> you can take the man out from under the bonnet, but not the petrol out of his heart. Oh, here's the real thing. These are engineering mock-up body panels. They're lumpy and bumpy. This car will go uh, approximately 180 mile an hour. Gene is skeptical of Trump's claim to be restoring auto jobs. And these are all what we call tier one automotive suppliers. These are the companies that design and manufacture steering, brakes, engines, transmissions here in the suburbs. They ought to be rooting for Donald Trump, shouldn't they? Because he says he's going to bring all the motor business back here. Well, yeah, he says that. He's, he's clearly not done his homework. Business decisions were made four years ago uh, on what's going to be manufactured automobile-wise and where it's going to be manufactured. And uh, those, those decisions have been made and uh, they are not going to be changed lightly based upon what Trump asks them to do. Uh, when Donald Trump says that he has already started transforming cities like Detroit, bringing American automobile jobs back to America. I mean, is, he, is he living in the past or what? Uh, yeah, I think he's uh, delusional. Uh, Detroit was once one of the powerhouses of America, the center of the country's motor industry. It's also had its own homegrown Donald Trump figure in the form of a man called Hazen S. Pingree, a self-made businessman who ran for political office, promising to clean up corruption and got elected mayor four times and died known as the idol of the people. Trump hopes to be as popular as Pingree. He's deploying both of his presidential superpowers, that supposed business acumen and a genius for direct communication, to try to make it happen. So will they be enough? How is Donald Trump, the businessman president, doing? Uh, certainly there are parts of his agenda that the business community at the broad strokes level is wildly supportive of. The tactics, however, you know, cause a significant amount of concern. So we're hoping we can get the reform without some of the hysteronics. Sandy Barur is boss of the Detroit Chamber of Commerce. He was Assistant Secretary of Commerce in the last Republican administration. When he says that he has brought many jobs back to a place like Detroit, is he telling the truth? I will give him a little bit of credit here uh, for the following reason. It is hard to uh, determine what decisions a company has made 
based on political rhetoric. But some of it might be due to currying favor with the existing administration. I don't doubt that. Now, if that turns to be a long-term trend, and if that leads to more employment in the United States, that, may, that will be a good thing. And now he's claiming credit for trillions of dollars being generated during his time in office on the stock market. When you look at the performance of the stock market, clearly there is something that has happened with Donald Trump's election that has made the stock market accelerate its growth. I think Donald Trump can claim some credit for that. He is flying in the face of quite a long process of globalization and transfers of capital and multinationalism. What he is doing is that he is channeling the very real fears that many Americans have about their future. We are now moving, I feel, uh, from a conversation of left versus right, you know, political left versus political right, to a kind of winners and losers. Donald Trump is my president. I may not have voted for him, but he is my president, and I want him desperately to succeed. Because if he succeeds, it means our nation is succeeding. Detroit became a byword for American urban decline, something that Donald Trump seized upon. We financed and built one global project after another, but ignored the fates of our children in the inner cities of Chicago, Baltimore, Detroit. Mothers and children trapped in poverty in our inner cities. Rusted out factories scattered like tombstones across the landscape of our nation. He struck a chord with the millions across America who are struggling. His campaign put the forgotten man and woman at its heart. It's a dark vision, and one that he says inspires his presidential ambition. One by one, the factories shuttered and left our shores, with not even a thought about the millions and millions of American workers that were left behind. From this day forward, a new vision will govern our land. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. America first. America first is at the heart of Trump's plan for his country. But not everyone here believes it's possible or even desirable. I don't know about this president trying to restore any kind of spirit of America. I think, if anything, he's destroying the spirit of America because the spirit of America is about free people and not uh, people that you can buy by your money. Detroit already has a hero for dark times. In a workshop downtown, he's taking shape. Robocop is back. This statue's been in the works from long before Trump was elected, but its creators feel that Robocop's time has come. It's more about showing the strength of the people of Detroit because we happen to be some of the toughest, but at the end, hardest working middle class in the United States. And Detroit will have Robocop. We are a tough town. We need a tough guy, you know. Maybe if Robo Prez makes good on his promises to the inner cities, they'll warm to the tough guy in chief. But some areas won't be easily won. Donald Trump has a unique capacity to turn the stomachs of West Coast liberals. California is playing a really interesting role in the resistance here in the U.S but it's been really inspiring to see it's not just a California thing, it's not just a New York thing. This is a national movement and we're seeing it all over the place. This is what democracy looks like! This is what democracy looks like! Hold that thought. Democrats 
angry at the outcome of the last democratic election. So they're determined to make sure it goes their way next time. Miriam, Matt and Maria are leading a movement called Swing Left, targeting swing districts nationwide for the 2018 elections to the House of Representatives. Some of them are in very vulnerable districts, so if we can really focus our energy there, that's going to be the way we can flip the U.S. House of Representatives, which can then have an actual body of Congress willing to stand up to Donald Trump. For them, this fight isn't just political, it's personal. I came to the United States with my family when I was six years old from Colombia, um, and I never felt um, like this was in my country, or my country didn't want me. I knew nothing except progress. I knew nothing but having a society that is inclusive and welcoming to people. And so for me, when Trump won, um, my entire world was shook into its core. I don't have an option to sit back. The Democrats are not in power. I don't have Obama, who's my all-time savior, for example, and I, I need to be the voice of, of the resistance. Is it possible that Donald Trump could be the saving of liberal America? I think that Barack Obama really did galvanize liberals. People really resonated with his messages of hope and change. Um, but I think eight years passed and a lot of us got really complacent. Um, so unfortunately, I do think that there's uh, some truth to the fact that Donald Trump is inspiring people to act, maybe who, hadn't, who have never acted before or who haven't acted in a long time. But will their efforts even matter? After all, Trump has promised to finish off the system. We are going to drain the swamp in Washington, D.C. It's a great slogan, but time and again in these first hundred days, what he calls the swamp has sucked Trump down, as he learned with his travel ban or with his failed attempt to dismantle Obama's health care scheme when he couldn't even take his own party with him. Slogans are easy, but governing is hard. You need friends. This man believes, quote, in the art of the deal. He wrote the book. OK, I want to see the deal. Shouldn't you be giving him a measure of support? I'm ready to. But he's got to step forward and say, let's get into the world where we can sit at a table in a respectful way and deal with the problem. Do you want to rebuild the infrastructure of America? I'm pulling up a chair right now. He talked about draining the swamp. Do you not fear that you may be a swamp creature? As a person who's been in Congress as long as I have, I'm suspect to start with. But when you look at his cabinet, a cabinet of billionaires and bankers, you just wonder, you know, why we're still swimming in this swamp and, and making it a little murkier. And you'd like to see more swamp creatures in the cabinet, No, you? not necessarily. What I would like to see are people Career who, politicians? Not necessarily that either, but people who take their jobs seriously, have a background in public service. For instance, our new Secretary of State, a very successful businessman and a good fellow, let me tell you, just based on one meeting I've had with him. Background in public service, virtually zero. Understanding of diplomacy, virtually nothing. Now that to me is not where you should turn to when you want leadership on diplomacy. So where does Trump turn for leadership on diplomacy? What's the Japanese for give me my hand back? At times, Trump seems to make it up on the spot. So I'm looking at two state and one state, and I like the one that both parties like. With several rounds of golf, discreet hand-holding, and some rather shouty phone calls with fellow world leaders. When you hear about the tough phone calls I'm having, don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it. They're tough. We have to be tough. It's time we're going to be a little tough, folks. We're taken advantage of by every nation in the world virtually. It's not going to happen anymore. Thank you. At first, these freewheeling moments were seen as inexperienced. Though if Boris Johnson can get away with gaffes, why not? I think part of it is just he's a complete novice at diplomacy and governance. 
and I think he f doesn't truly understand the implications of things he says, uh, especially not as President of the United States. And I also think that he's somebody who's chiefly concerned with himself. And so when you're a neophyte and you're mostly, if not entirely, concerned with yourself and you're President of the United States, then, then that can be a dangerous combination. Dangerous for whom? When campaigning, the America First candidate Trump contrasted himself with hawkish Hillary. But then this happened. Tonight I ordered a targeted military strike on the airfield in Syria from where the chemical attack was launched. Trump said his missiles were retaliation for a Syrian government gas attack on its own citizens. Even many liberals approved. And you see these beautiful kids that are dead in their father's arms. When you see that, I immediately called General Mattis. I said, what can we do? In sending cruise missiles into Syria, Trump did something Obama didn't dare to do, and it made him look moral and presidential. It's one thing, though, to face down dictators. The question is, does Trump have a strategy for the world? His ally Ted Malak thinks the president's instincts and the experienced military advisers he picked have served him well. In the case of the Syrian filming, which was shown on any number of outlets, uh, of children and babies being gassed to death, I think he acted quite appropriately and said, this is inhumane, this is unacceptable. And frankly, many other world leaders said the same thing, but it was America that was able to put down that marker. There is a new sheriff in town, and his name is Donald J. Trump. A few days later, the sheriff dropped this the mother of all bombs onto an Islamic State tunnel complex in Afghanistan. And then this. Trump set a course for confrontation that previous presidents have steered clear of. He ordered a fleet towards North Korea, or so he claimed. Some find the idea of Trump tackling a nuclear power terrifying. Others think he's up for it. I'm worried about that 3 a.m. knock on the door to President Trump saying, I'm sorry to wake you, but something terrible's just happened and you have five minutes to make a decision. So there's an old dictum in American foreign policy that you speak softly and carry a big stick. I would say Donald Trump is actually turning that a bit on his head and is using a large megaphone and actually using the big stick. The world is a dangerous place, uh, and I think that you'll see Trump exercise American power in the next few hundred days. What are we doing right now in terms of North Korea? You never know, do you? You never know. Some people have called these the worst hundred presidential days in history. Well, they're not. Within his first few weeks, Abraham Lincoln had lost many of the southern states and by the time of his hundredth day the ninth president William Henry Harrison had been dead for weeks. People who claim to know politics have belittled and underrated Donald Trump before. Donald Trump has been underestimated at every turn primarily by people like me people who are part of the establishment I lost many steak dinners uh, during the course of the campaign. Donald Trump would never decide to run. Donald Trump would never be number one in the polls. Donald Trump would never be the presidential nominee. There is no way that Donald Trump uh, will be elected president of the United States. I lost all of those bets. Don't lose any more. I've stopped betting uh, against Donald Trump. Trump has learned that he can bypass those nasty people in the media to speak directly to his supporters. He's a genius in my eyes, and I'll always 
before him. And I want you to know that I agree with his Make America Beautiful and Great Again. And he's discovered exactly when he needs allies and when he can act alone, defying the enemies who detest him. He wants to intimidate his enemies. He wants to call them enemies. He wants the public to think of them as enemies of the people. And this is the strategy of a tyrant. The whole Hundred Days yardstick began in 1933 with Franklin D. Roosevelt after America had been plunged into a financial crisis which began here in the Guardian Bank in Detroit. During his first hundred days, Trump has had one of the most spectacular crash courses in government the world has ever seen. It's far